Now that we've covered some of the history of integrated circuit design, um, just a little bit of an introduction. Uh, I think I mentioned before uh, we'll be talking about integrated circuits. Uh, basically IC uh, is what I'll, I'll use interchangeably with integrated circuit. Uh, and this is basically many transistors on one chip. So uh, there's various different levels of integrated circuits. Um, we'll be mostly working on VLSI design, which stands for Very Large Scale Integration. Um, that means anything more than a thousand transistors on a chip. Uh, so if you, you can have thousands, millions, or billions uh, at this point of transistors on one chip. And uh, that's what we'll be uh, working with um, as we go forward. So uh, for the most part, we'll be working with CMOS, which is complementary metal oxide semiconductor. So these are uh, pretty fast in today, you know, compared to other uh, transistors. Um, and because of the, the modern process technology, uh, they're pretty cheap on a per transistor basis and low power transistors. And I'll be uh, going through today how to build your own simple CMOS chip um, using CMOS transistors, uh, how, to, how to go through and, and what CMOS transistor, um, we'll be going through the basics of CMOS transistors, um, how to build logic gates from those transistors, and a little bit um, in terms of transistor layout and fabrication. Um, and that's what I'll be going through in the lecture today. Uh, during the rest of the course, we'll be going into more detail on how to build a good CMOS chip. So in this course, we'll be talking about silicon-based CMOS transistors. So P-type um, PMOS transistors and NMOS transistors that are built on a silicon substrate. And silicon is a group four material uh, in the periodic table. And it forms a crystal lattice with each silicon atom bound to four of its neighbors. And so this uh, below shows kind of a three by three where the middle silicon atom is bound to four of its neighbors. Each of those neighbors is bound to four of its neighbors. Um, I don't show a greater grid, but, but the ones on the outside will all be bound in, and uh, in a big, uh, much larger uh, uh, piece of silicon where all of the silicon atoms are bound to four of their neighbors. So silicon is a semiconductor, but pure silicon has only a small number of thermally generated carriers, and so it actually conducts electricity pretty poorly. Um, so in order to use it um, effectively for our purposes, uh, we add dopants um, to silicon in order to improve the conductivity. And there's two different types of dopants we can add, either group five dopants um, that have an extra electron to them, such as boron, and this will produce n-type silicon, where uh, electron carriers are n-type carrier. And there, for each boron um, atom that's in the crystal, we'll get an extra electron um, to carry current um, through, the, uh, through the substrate. Um, additionally, we can uh, do dopants that are group three type atoms that are missing an electron and they produce what we call a hole and a p-type so it's a positive um, type carrier and these uh, a couple examples of the most common atoms that we use for uh, p-type silicon are arsenic and phosphorus so when we add either p-type or n-type dopants to silicon, um, we can produce, uh, we can add some p-type in one uh, 
part of the silicon and n-type dopants to another part. Uh, and if those two um, types of silicon are next to each other, they create a junction between them of the p-type and n-type semiconductor, and this forms a diode. Uh, we talked about these uh, previously in EE321, um, and the way a diode works is the current will only flow in one direction. Um, the current will flow from the p-type through to the n-type, and so if we put a positive voltage on the p-type and a negative voltage on the n-type, we'll get current flow, uh, but if we put it the other way or went round, uh, we will get no current flow. And the p-type is uh, called the anode and the n-type is a cathode in a p-n junction. So now that we've gone through the basics of silicon semiconductor and how we create n-type and p-type silicon, I'd like to go through the basics of an NMOS transistor. Now you should have gone through and learned about NMOS and PMOS transistors in EE321 and EE323 here at Oregon Tech. So I'm not going to go today through the detailed uh, functionality and equations of how uh, NMOS and PMOS transistors work, but I do want to go through um, how we create uh, NMOS and PMOS transistors from the standpoint of integrated circuits and how we use them, uh, what uh, the source gate drain. Um, so an NMOS and PMOS transistor is consistent of, in order to use it, we have four terminals that we need to connect up to electrical sources. Uh, those four terminals are the gate terminal, the source, the drain, and the body, also called the bulk um, in a lot of cases as well. Uh, so the gate terminal is basically uh, connected through an oxide to the body. So you can see on uh, the, the little graph below, that figure below, that we have the gate and then we have an oxide between the gate and the bulk or body of the transistor. Um, this means the gate is basically a capacitor. And um, the gate and body are conductors, but they have the silicon dioxide layer between them, which is an insulator. And so that gives us what, um, in, in the old days, um, the gate was a metal, and so that gives us metal oxide, and then the body is a semiconductor, and so that gives us what we call the MOS. So MOSFET is metal oxide semiconductor. That's where the MOS comes from. So uh, for a long period, for initially gates were made of metal, then for a long period of time, the gate was made of polysilicon, as you can see in this figure. Um, it's pointing to the gate as polysilicon. Um, and currently, in the most rec uh, latest process technologies, uh, metal gates are starting to return. And so we're actually back to being MOSFET, even though for a period of time, um, gates were made out of polysilicon. Um, the source and drain are made of N plus type silicon, so highly doped N um, silicon, and the body or bulk is a more lightly doped P type silicon for an NMOS transistor. So as far as operation is concerned, uh, in order to operate an NMOS, the body or bulk is typically tied to ground, or it, it's usually tied to the lowest voltage in the circuit, which most times um, when we're working with integrated circuits, we work with ground as the lowest voltage, and then we have some sort of VCC uh, or higher voltage, um, which is our, uh, and we have like two voltages that will usually operate between um, the source and drain and gate and bulk of a NMOS transistor. Um, so when the gate is at a low voltage, so the body is connected to ground, and if we have the gate also connected to low voltage or ground, 
then the p-type body is at a low voltage and the source to body and drain to body diodes are off because if the p-type uh, bulk or body is at ground and that's the lowest voltage then you're never going to be forward biased for your p-n junction to the bulk to source or bulk to drain and so if you have your body at ground and your gate at low voltage or ground then no transistor uh, the transistor is off and there's no current flowing so uh, the NMOS operation if we have our gate at low voltage it's off and there's no current flowing now if we have our gate at high voltage now we have a positive charge between the uh, gate of the MOS for the, the metal oxide semiconductor um, and the positive charge of the gate will cause charge, negative charge to be attracted to the oxide in the bulk. So right along the area where the bulk is in contact with the silicon dioxide between the source and drain negative charge will be attracted right to the surface of where that oxide is. This will create a channel of negative charge right under the gate there um, and that channel will be between the source and the drain so we now have uh, an inverted channel right under the gate that has n-type carriers in it and so current can flow between the source and the drain which are n-type um, silicon. So now we have a source of current to flow between the source and drain and the transistor is a switch that's been turned on. So when we have the gate high for an NMOS will basically have an it is a switch that is turned on and when the gate was low in the previous example it's a switch that's turned off so the PMOS transistor is very similar to the NMOS transistor it has the same basic structure but all of the doping profiles are reversed and the voltages are reversed so in this case Again, since we want to make sure the, uh, the PN junctions are always re reverse biased or zero biased, um, such that they don't become forward biased, uh, in this case, the bulk silicon is N-type silicon. The drain and source are P-type silicon. So if we don't want to forward bias the PN junction, we want to make sure that the N is always the, the bulk silicon or body of the transistor is always tied to the highest voltage available. And if that's true, then the PN junction can never be forward biased. So we'll tie the body of the P-type transistor to our power supply, VDD, highest value of power supply. And then in this case, since the body is tied to VDD, if we tie the gate to our lowest voltage, which is typically ground, then when the gate is tied to ground, the gate and body have a voltage across it. And the body has the positive voltage. So when the gate is connected to a lower voltage, there will be P-type carriers that will be attracted to the polysilicon and attracted to the uh, basically the silicon dioxide layer that's attached to the bulk and that p-type carrier uh, will basically create an inversion region right along the silicon dioxide between the source and the drain and that will be in the bulk silicon. So there will be a channel of p-type carriers between the source and drain which will basically allow current to flow and turn the transistor on. So 
In this case, if our gate is low or tied to VSS or ground, then the transistor will be turned on and it will be a switch that's on. If the gate is high, then the gate will be the same voltage, VDD, as the bulk and the bulk will just have no carriers attracted to the surface. It will be n-type and no current will flow between the PN junctions and so there will be no current flow between the source and drain and so when the gate is high the transistor will be a switch that's off. When we draw the transistor um, to the left, uh, lower left region, there's a little transistor drawn there uh, that has a bubble next to the connection where the, the gate connection is to the transistor. And that bubble indicates that it has inverted behavior relative to the NMOS device. So if you see a transistor that has no bubble, it'll be an NMOS transistor and a transistor uh, um, that has a bubble for the symbol uh, will be a P-type transistor. So I'd like to uh, just talk a little bit about the supply voltage uh, that we use in integrated circuit chips. Um, in the previous few foils when I've been talking about uh, connecting up the gate and drain and source, I, I've been mentioning that uh, the ground zero volts is typically always our lowest voltage in an integrated circuit uh, for various different reasons. Um, sometimes there's exceptions to that, but for this course I'm, I'm going to mostly assume that, that ground is our lowest voltage. Uh, but when I've been talking about the positive power supply, I've just mentioned VDD and not mentioned what voltage, a specific voltage for that. Um, and the reason for that is over the course of the last uh, 30 to 40 years, VDD has, has been changing. In the 1980s, uh, we used a, the highest power supply that we typically used on integrated circuit chips was 5 volts. But over the course of the years, VDD has been decreasing in modern processes. And um, part of the reason for that is because having a 5 volt power supply in today's modern chips would actually damage the transistors. Uh, as we've uh, decreased the gate sizes, we've also uh, decreased the thickness of the oxide under the gate. Um, so having a higher voltage across a, a thinner oxide would eventually cause tunneling through through the gate uh, and cause current to flow between uh, the gate and the bulk and or body of the transistor. Um, so that's one reason for reducing the voltage. Uh, but the second reason, as I mentioned several slides ago, was that a lower VDD, a lower voltage saves power because power is related to voltage squared um, in uh, the, the current and, and power that's consumed in the device, a lower voltage actually saves power by a square law. And so they've been uh, reducing voltage both to save power and to um, not damage the transistors. So over the years, uh, we've reduced voltage, um, stepping it down to 3.3, 2.5. Uh, currently, um, the highest voltages that are typically in the, the most modern uh, microprocessors are on the order of 1 volt to maybe possibly up to 1.5, but you know 1 to 1.2 volts uh, typically. And um, a lot of times to, to save power, uh, they will even scale the voltage down into 0 0.8, 0 0.7, possibly 0 0.6 volts. Uh, for lower performance but lower power consumption uh, applications, especially in, in mobile um, applications.